This is a purely neocolonial syndrome that despises the sovereign equality of states and the tasks of strengthening the principles of the UN Charter through effective multilateralism, which are brought to our discussion today in an effort to prevent the democratization of interstate relations. The United States and its allies are increasingly openly and unceremoniously privatizing the secretariats of international organizations. They are pushing through, bypassing established procedures decisions to create mechanisms subordinate to them with non-consensual mandates, but with a claim to the right to blame those who for some reason are not pleasing to Washington. In this regard, I would like to remind you of the need for strict implementation of the UN Charter not only by member states, but also by the Secretariat of our organization. In accordance with Article 100 of the Charter, the Secretariat is required to act impartially and it must not receive instructions from any government. We have already talked about Article 2 of the UN Charter and I want to draw your attention to its key item number one. The organization is based on the principle of the sovereign equality of states. Developing this principle, the UN General Assembly, in the 1970 declaration I mentioned, confirmed, I quote, the inalienable right of every state to choose its political, economic, social and cultural system without interference from anyone, end of quote. In this regard, we have serious questions about the statements that our distinguished Secretary General made on March 29 that, I quote, autocratic rule does not guarantee stability. It is a catalyst for chaos and conflict. And strong democratic societies are capable of self-correction and self-improvement. They can stimulate change, even radical change, without bloodshed or violence. End of quote. I can't help but remember the changes brought about by the aggressive adventures of strong democracies in Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and many other countries. The Honorable Antonio Guterres went on to say, and I quote, that democracies are centers of broad cooperation rooted in the principles of equality, participation and solidarity. End of quote. It is noteworthy that all these speeches were made at the so-called Summit for Democracy, convened by President Joe Biden outside the UN, the participants of which were selected by the American administration on the basis of loyalty, and loyalty not so much to Washington as to the ruling Democratic Party in the United States. Attempts to use such peer-to-peer -peer forums to discuss issues of a global nature directly contradict paragraph 4 of Article 1 of the UN Charter, which sets out the need, I quote, to ensure the role of the UN as a center for coordinating actions in achieving common goals. Contrary to this principle, several years ago France and Germany proclaimed an alliance of multilateralists, into which they also invited only those who are obedient, which in itself again confirms the reluctance to get rid of the colonial mentality and the attitude of the initiators to the principle of effective multilateralism, which is on our agenda today. At the same time, the idea of the European Union is the ideal of that same multilateralism was inculcated. There are now calls from Brussels to expand the EU's membership as soon as possible, including, in particular, the Balkan countries. But the main pathos is not about Serbia, not about Turkey, which have been conducting hopeless negotiations on joining the EU for decades, but about Ukraine, claiming to be an ideologist of Euro integration. Borrell recently did not hesitate to speak out that the Kiev regime should be accepted into the European Union as soon as possible, allegedly, if not for the war. This would have taken years. But this can and should be done without any criteria. Serbia, Turkey and others will wait. And Ukraine needs to be admitted into the European Union out of turn. By the way, at the same summit for democracy, the Secretary General declared, and I quote, democracy stems from the UN Charter. The first words of the UN Charter we the peoples reflect the fundamental source of legitimacy, the consent of those under control, end of quote. It is useful to correlate this thesis with the track record of the Kiev regime, which launched a war against a huge part of its own people, 
against those millions of people who did not consent to govern themselves to neo-Nazis and Russophobes who illegally seized power in the country and buried the Minsk agreements approved by the UN Security Council, thereby undermining territorial integrity of Ukraine for those who, contrary to the UN Charter, divide humanity into democracies and autocracies, it would not hurt them to answer the question of which category they classify the Ukrainian regime in, I'm not expecting an answer. Speaking about the principles of the UN Charter, the question arises about the relationship of the Security Council with the General Assembly. The Western Collective has been aggressively and for a long time pushing the topic of abuse of the veto right and, through not entirely correct pressure on other UN members, it achieved a decision that after each use of this right, which the West is increasingly deliberately provoking, the corresponding topic should be considered at the General Assembly. This does not pose any problem for us. Because Russia's approaches to all issues on the agenda are open. We have nothing to hide. And it is not difficult for us to state this position again. In addition, the use of the veto is an absolutely legitimate tool provided for in the UN Charter in order to prevent the adoption of decisions. That would be fraught with a split in the organization, but if the procedure for discussing cases of the use of the veto at the General Assembly is approved, then why not think about those Security Council resolutions that were not vetoed, which were adopted, including many years ago, but which are never implemented, notwithstanding the provisions of Article 25 of the UN Charter. Why doesn't the General Assembly consider the reasons for this state of affairs, for example, with regard to Security Council resolutions on Palestine? and on the entire range of problems of the Middle East and North Africa, on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, as well as on Resolution 2202, which approved the Minsk agreements on Ukraine. The problem associated with sanctions regimes also requires attention. It has already become the norm that the Security Council, after lengthy negotiations, in strict accordance with the UN Charter, approves sanctions against a specific country, and then the United States and its allies impose additional so-called unilateral restrictions against the same state, which have not received approval in the Security Council and are not included in its resolution as part of the agreed package. In this same series, there is another glaring example, this is the decision just taken by Berlin, Paris and London through their national legislation to extend the restrictions on Iran that expire in October, which are subject to legal termination in accordance with Resolution 22-31, that is, European countries and Britain say that the Security Council decision has expired, but they don't care about this, they have their own rules. All this makes it more urgent to consider the issue of ensuring that after the Security Council adopts any sanctions resolution, none of the UN members would have the right to devalue it by introducing their own illegitimate restrictions against the same country. It is also important that all sanctions regimes through the Security Council be time-limited, since their open-ended nature deprives the Council of flexibility in terms of influencing the policies of sanctioned governments. The topic of the so-called humanitarian limits of sanctions also requires attention. It would be right that henceforth the introduction of any sanctions projects to the Security Council would be accompanied by the provision of assessments of their consequences for citizens through UN humanitarian agencies and not by demagogic statements from Western colleagues that ordinary people will not suffer. Dear colleagues, the facts speak of a deep crisis in international relations and a lack of desire and will in the West to overcome this crisis, but I hope that a way out of the current situation still exists and it will be found. To begin with, everyone needs to realize responsibility for the fate of our organization and for the fate of the world in a historical context and not from the point of view of opportunistic electoral and momentary alignments in the next national elections of a particular member state. Let me remind you again, almost 80 years ago, by signing the UN Charter, world leaders agreed to respect the sovereign equality of all states, large and small, rich and poor, monarchies and republics. In other words, even then humanity recognized the need for an equal, Polycentric world order is a guarantee of the sustainability and security of its development, therefore, today we are not talking about submitting to some kind of rules-based world order, but we are talking about fulfilling by everyone the obligations assumed when signing and ratifying the UN Charter in its entirety and interconnection. Thank you for attention.